Amen. Amen. You know, as I was preparing this week for for tithes and offerings, I, I got to thinking, sometimes I really wonder, why do we do the things that we do? Why do we worship? Why do we tell people about Jesus? Why do we take that to our jobs and, and, and express our love for Christ? Why do we give? Why do we do these things? And in the book of Hebrews, the author was telling Jewish Christians who were really oppressed and there was all sorts of people telling them that there were other ways to heaven. There were other ways to a peaceful life, to something that was really fruitful in their life. There were other ways to do that, a, a lot like today. And he was, at the end of the book, in chapter 13, he was expressing all the different things that they needed to remember. And in verse 12, he begins to tell them, so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp, bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is, that is the fruit of the lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good out, do good to this, I'm sorry, to the, <laughs> to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. And it, it, it got me to thinking as I read that, I just want to remember as we give this morning what God did for me and why that sacrifice comes from me, why my, sac my, why my praise becomes a sacrifice in my life. Why do I worship? Why do I give? Why do I try to tell people about Jesus? Why do I do these different things? And it's because of the sacrifice that God made in his son for us. And you may be sitting here and you wonder, why do all these people, maybe you haven't been here that long, why do they all worship him so fervently? Why, do they, why are they so ready to do whatever it is that God wants them to do. And it's because there was a sacrifice made for us and for you. Father, this morning, we just pray that you be with each and every one of us here. Lord, that you bless our gift. Father, that you would use it to further your kingdom. Lord, that you would anoint the rest of this service, that you would be with us. Father, that your manifest presence would come here, Lord, and move in this place. Father, pour out your spirit on us today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Yeah. 
He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He provides a way for us. He is there with us always. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. If you believe that this morning, then sing it out. Give him praise this morning. Last week we talked about weaknesses, and this morning we're going to talk about open doors. We're all under the influence of demonic experience. Do you think in our, our, our minds we could be in the state that we're in with people value, not valuing each other the way we do? There's something that happens in the, in the political realms, in the powers that, that be over our country, and not only our country, but in over in other countries as well. How many have ever seen... Uh, the guy that's, he's like the new Mission Impossible guy. He's amazing. Uh, uh, Liam Nelson. What's that movie? The yeah, Taken and, and, and Returned or something. He, he has these movies that he plays in. He is just bad, isn't he? he? He takes on a whole army. All these guys from Ukraine, about 10 of them or 20 or maybe, maybe, maybe 30 or 40. It doesn't matter. He was given an agenda to get his daughter back. And he went through and just tore everybody up and killed people and all that. It was just great, the movie is. <laughs> but let me tell you this. The re reality of that movie is that things like that happen all the time. We have people taken into captivity and, and trafficking. And it's, it, maybe it's for sex slaves or maybe it's just for kids for child labor or whatever. But there is a rampant on a world today of the demoralization of human life as long as it isn't me. And we look at our uh, um, uh, Hollywood people and, and people out in Hollywood, California, and, and, and mega rich also, they have a mentality that you are expendable. They do, it's just, it's just a common thing. They think that everybody is expendable except them. And they will do whatever it takes to get themselves farther along or bless more in their life or, and they'll spend whatever because you don't matter. You don't to them. But you matter to someone who is so much higher and greater than what they are. Hey, it's the truth. And so we think about the depravity of mankind on our planet and we see this taking place in the earth in which we live. We cannot in the natural be as evil as we are. We couldn't. We couldn't. How many here ever... Uh, so what is something that everybody likes? What is something you like to eat? Chocolate, Chocolate Chick-fil-A, the Lord's Chicken, what else? Bacon. What? Bacon. 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 Biscuits and gravy. Okay, we're, we're getting a lot of different opinions, but let's go stay safe. Let's say that uh, everybody in here likes ribeye steak, all right? And you know what? You're only allowed to have it one time in life. 
all of us. The thing that we like, just once in a life, we get to take care of it and partake of it and cut it up into little pieces and, and along with a baked potato and a little bit of ketchup or, or whatever and roll. I know it's ruined with the ketchup, I know, but, but, but enjoy that steak. But you're never satisfied with that, are you? Because even if I'm full and I'm bloated, oh, I can't eat anymore, the next day I wake up, I say, man, Wanda, those White Castles were great last night, weren't they? <laughs> or that ribeye was great last night, wasn't it? There's something about us that, that we have this um, order in our life that once we've had something, we want to have it again. We want to have it again and again. It doesn't matter what it takes. If you've ever, you ever been an addict, you really relate to this. Because once you ever experience the things that, that addiction does, now addiction is a lot of areas, but once it gets this tangle and this claws in you, it keeps calling you to come back. You're never fulfilled. Am I right? Never fulfilled. You can never get enough. Just one more time. Just one time. And after you do it, you're sick to your stomach or you wish, oh, I wish I had done that. But then you go right back again and again. And uh, this morning I want to talk to you about things that we get attachments in our life. I'm going to talk about three different ones. The first one I'm going to be real, real brief in. Um, in John chapter 10, it, it says that thief, the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and to destroy. I'm come that you may have life and you have, may have it more abundantly. How many of you have ever heard that before? Everybody's hand goes up. Everybody knows John 10, 10. But for some reason, we just get excited about the, he has come that we have life and have it more abundantly. But we forget to realize that the first part of that is there is an enemy out there and he wants to steal, he wants to kill, he wants to destroy you. And the first part about, take something that we're all supposed to possess. Our very life, the life in which we have, it becomes um, um, forfeited because of things that the enemy tries to do in our life, that your life doesn't matter. None of us in here matter in the eyes of Satan. None of us in here matter to all of his fellow demonic and, and cohorts or whatever. None of us matter because, see, we're not going to kill a demon. You're not going to kill Satan. He'll come in your life and he'll sit there and he'll rest for years and years and years until you finally get sick of it or if somebody finally tells you, you don't have to have this thing controlled in your life. I'm not saying to possess, but I'm saying controlled and you give an entrance into your life. And I begin to think, what, what about these things? These, these demons are never killed, so they're just content to take you and make you just as miserable as anybody else. But Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. And when I think about this, it's a, it's a, it's a great warfare that's going on. And then you, you may be in here thinking, well, he's, he's really got out to the last two weeks. But the thing is, it's true. It's absolutely truth. There's things that control us and things that keep us bound for years. And I'm going to talk about three different things. The first one is your tongue. Words you speak. It matters what you speak. How you speak. In Ephesians chapter 4, we have to be careful with how we speak things. We bring things on ourselves. And so many times in the past, I, was, I started to say something good because my wife can tell you, if I say something good, I know that next week something bad's going to happen. Has anybody else ever been that way? I'm speaking something positive, and I know, well, Satan's going to raise his head up. And I became a victim with that mentality. As a believer, as a preacher, get up and speaking every week, I became controlled by what I feared. The thing that I feared the most, and I would try to speak over, and I just things began to fear began to wreck my life. And then, when it, and then if it happened that week, and it, all times it did, because in a roundabout way, I was giving Satan permission to come in and torment me and my family again. We need to understand our positions in authority in our in our home. If you're a husband and a mother, it is very critical the words you say and you don't say, things you encourage or things you. The things that come out of our mouth are very, very relevant. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 25. So you must stop telling lies. Tell each other the, tr the truth because we all belong to each other in the same body. When you are angry, do not sin. Be sure to stop your anger. Be sure to stop being angry before the end of the day. What happens if you go to bed mad? A lot of times you become more angry as the night goes on. You don't rest well. I know there's times that my wife and I, we hardly ever, ever argue. Hardly ever. What are you laughing for? <laughs> will, you, 
you, some of you, you hardly ever, ever argue. But if you do, and you go to bed angry, a lot of times you get up the next morning and you're so angry. Or if you're like me, um, I have dreams sometime, and I have a dream that there's this, there's this actor. Sorry, Wanda. I won't tell you who he is, but I had a dream way back when we first got married that I was at this place, and this guy is an actor. His name's Rob Lowe. I, oh, what's that? say? He is the prettiest man ever. He makes me sick. Anyway, and, and there was a competition for Wanda's hand with me and him. Guess who she chose? So now, so now anytime he comes on the TV, switch it. Leave that alone. Okay. Let's go ahead and read. When you're angry, do not stay angry. Be sure to stop being angry before the end of the day. Do not give way to the devil to defeat you. I thought, hmm. The ways the devil defeats us is by our words and by our actions and by how we say things. And I think it's so important that each of us needs to guard our heart. If, you have a, if you've had a problem in the past with cussing and swearing and, and just blasting people regardless, you don't have to live that way. I don't care what the genetics of your background is. I don't care what kind of strongholds your parents had or your grandparents. You do not have to continue to live that way. Because that defeats everything in your life that has been productive and anything that's, that's great and, and, and valuable, you begin to destroy with what words you speak and things that you say. Read verse 29 and 30. Oh, 28. Those who are stealing must stop, stop stealing and start working. They should earn an honest living for themselves. Then they will have something to share with those who are poor. When you talk, do not say harmful things. But say things that people need, words that will help others become stronger. Then you will do good to those who listen to you. And do not make the Holy Spirit sad, or in other words, grieve the Holy Spirit. The Spirit's proof that you belong to him. God gave you the Spirit that God gave to make you free when the final day comes. Okay, it is so important that we watch what we speak. I'm going to go spend a lot of time here. I'm going to go on to the next one. But watch what you say. Watch what you watch and watch who you hang with. Because every one of us have a tendency to, to sometimes hang around people and say things and, and be with people and, and let people say things that affect us. Um, go to number two. Uh, the second one is improper relationships. Has anybody ever had an improper relationship? What is an improper relationship? One that, one that is not benefi beneficial in your life. There's been a lot of people I've had relationships with. Some of them were long-term and some of them were short-term. And the reason a lot of them were really short-term is I knew to back up then. There's something about this relationship that wasn't right. It wasn't beneficial for me. And it was going to cause problems in my life. And so I began to back up and I get out of that relationship. Soul ties have a destruction, have a destructive purpose to you. But it was clear to you, those that you were in a relationship with. If you look back over the years, you look at people you used to be friends with and friend, people you're friends with now. And people that you used to be friends with, you know there's something about some things in their life that you didn't need to be in, involved in your life. Is that right? There's certain things that happens. I've told you a story, a story before about my father uh, admonishing me. There was a couple in my wife and I's life in Kentucky and there were great people but the look consuming and she was always wanting my, my wife over there and he was always wanting me to go with him and do this and do that and before long my father began to recognize something with this couple that they were trying to bring discord because they had so much discord in their family they tried to bring discord in ours and before long my dad said you know you need to put a little separation between you and them I said how come he said you just need to he would tell me details and I bet I stopped back and I talked to one about it and I watched from a distance and I could see the struggle begin to go on. And in, in, in here this morning, the relationships that you may have, that you need to step back and look at it and say, is this beneficial or is this bringing more harm than good? Relationships with opposite sex or the same sex. Sexual relations are often, they often have attachments. And I'll tell you, 
guys or girls, either way, you get out in the world and you do your, your, do your thing and you're real promiscuous and involved in a lot of sexual activities with people. You never know what you're opening yourself, yourself up to. The Bible says that the two shall be what? One flesh after they consummate the marriage. There is something about when you get together with your husband and you consummate the marriage, there is something also spiritual about that. I'm not gonna say it, tell you that, um, I, won't, I won't go there. First Corinthians six sixteen. I'm going to read this to you in the message, message version. It's going to be a little lengthy, but there's more to sex than mere skin to skin. Sex is as much spiritual mystery as a physical fact. As it is written in scripture, the two shall become one. Since we want to become spiritually, spiritually one with the master, we must pursue the kind of sex that, have, that avoids commitment same sex that avoids commitment and intimacy leaves us more lonely than ever. The kind of sex that can never become one. And there's a lot of us, we don't understand. We thought, well, it's just pleasure. Let me tell you, there's something about sexual intercourse when you're with somebody, if it's the opposite sex or the same sex. Something happens to you in your mind. Something happens to you in your spirit. There's something you're opening yourself up to that you didn't bargain for. And I guarantee you there's people in here that have been, that got a lot of attachments is things that people have been involved in in their life. I'll finish reading. There's a sense in which sexual sins are different from all, from all others. In a sexual sin, we violate the sacredness of our own bodies. These bodies that were made for God, to, God given, God modeled love. You didn't realize, I'll find it in a minute, that your body is a sacred place, the place of the Holy Spirit. Don't you see that you can't live however you please, squandering whatever God has paid, paid for it with such a high price? For the physical property belonging to the spiritual part of you, God owns the whole works. So let people see God in you through your body. That there isn't something in our life where we're playing around with fires, what we're doing. Live with the with the the consequences of re, of uh, involvement in this. What am I trying to say? Also, there's a lot of consequences in people's lives because of they don't value this part. The only part that we often think of is just our prayer time and our spirit part. But it's important how you conduct yourself outside of this environment. One night flings with someone, open our lives to all of their bondages. A spiritual bondage that two people make leaving out God in the relationship. It's an entire life. If you take a person, it's a believer with a non-believer. Every time they're involved in things sexually, they're, they're stepping down their self. They're stepping down their, their spiritual emphasis in their own life to say, okay, I'm going to succumb to this, this act with them. And they're not a believer. Even if they were a believer, if it's outside of marriage, it's, it's, it's condemned. It's cursed. And 2 Corinthians uh, 6.14 says, do not be unequally yoked, unequally yoked with, with unbelievers. That means there's something about that scripture. There's, there's a value in this scripture about things that we bring upon ourselves that, that not realizing that there's side effects. Man, there is. There's great heaviness upon many lives because of things that get involved in, in their life, in their, especially when you know better. What fellowship hath, hath darkness with the light, or righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath the light with darkness? Unequally yoked relationships. Ever notice how are drawn to darkness sometimes? Okay, I've used this example before. When we were at church camp, and there's great things happening in the kids' lives, and you have a young lady in the church, and, and she's serving the Lord, and she goes, to, she goes to camp, she's so invigorated, so excited, and so, so sold out to the Lord because of this relationship she has with him, and she has freedom there, no bondages, nothing holding her back. But when she comes back home after a great week of success, she comes back to the boyfriend, and there's ties with him sexually, it gets her right back in the same place she was before she went, and she feels dirty, she feels beat down, she feels discouraged, and so many times we get discouraged because we're maybe emotional 
And you think, well, why is he stronger than that? Because attachments were there before. And when you come back and those atta- same attachments are there, it's so easy to let those attachments back into our life. Sometimes the people have attachments with people and they're involved with people sexually. The people, the people they, were there, they were with and they got involved with, they, they love darkness. Their thoughts are dark. The images, their lifestyle. Honestly, I think that sometimes a lot of our problems are things we've been exposed to. Maybe denying ourselves or thinking there's not anything good in my life. And so all this evil, this, this darkness begins to fill their minds and their hearts. No goals, no expectations of one another who are involved in a sexual relation. It becomes more like um, walking a dog or or something simple, something is routine, and people are giving themselves away. And the only person you should be giving your way to is someone that you're married to. Premarital sex, homosexuality, bestiality, any other sadistic, sadistic thinking. Amos 3.3 3 says, can two walk together unless they have agreement? If you're going to continue walking this, that type of lifestyle, I promise, listen to me, I promise you will not stay on the right track that you're on. There will be a, a drawing down a lot easier. It'd be a lot easier to, for you to retract and go down where you used to be or maybe where you've never been because of the decision you're making. It just will. We carry the ability and power and determination to make our lives consistent, meaningful, and with purpose when we choose Christ. So don't live and compromise. Don't give a foothold to the devil because I promise you, he will take it. He will take it and he will dominate your life. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9. When you enter into the land of the Lord your God has given you, don't leave, no, don't learn to do hateful things that other nations do. Don't let anyone offer your son or daughter as a sacrifice in the fire, which is to Molech. Do not let anyone use magic or witchcraft. Try to explain the meaning of signs. Don't let anyone try to control, you, control others with magic. Don't let them be a medium and try to talk to the spirits of the dead people. The Lord hates anyone who does these things because of the nations, because of the nations do these things. And the Lord God will force them out of the land ahead of you. Now, let me go ahead and explain something here. Um, verse 9, do not become like others just because you're moving into the area. And instead of you becoming like them, they sh- you should be indoctrinating and, and trying to influence them. Unusual behaviors, sacrificing your offspring. I would never th- consider sacrifice. Matter of fact, none of us in here would probably, in our right mind spiritually, would think about sacrificing our kids. Or even abortion as far as that goes. You know, I, I remember 20 years ago here at the church, we had a... <clears throat> I'll go into detail, but I know there's a situation with somebody and, and their kids that got involved sexually. They weren't ready for it. Because guess what when it happens? Guess what happens? Maybe you don't know, don't know this or understand it yet, but when you get old enough to start having sexual relations with someone, guess what can happen in that relationship? Pregnancy. That's why it should be between you and your spouse. It's never appropriate before marriage it's never appropriate with somebody else that's why we have abortion issues that we have because everybody wants to get rid of the sin or get rid of the problem because now it's obvious to all you start going to other spiritual advisor i'm going to talk about how many's ever had any crystals in your house he start having some crystals because they're just pretty stones. They're really cool. I get a, a warm energy from these things. You know, and my life has been better since I have these crystals. What do you think is, is going on with you having crystals? Putting your faith in what? In something else besides God. And you begin to have these crystals. You begin to, uh, maybe a Ouija board. And you think, well, that's too bad. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. But you go and you read a horoscope. There's a variety of things that we begin to do. 
The first and second commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me and thou shalt not have any graven images. Inappropriate relationships will always bring death to the life of a believer. So do things that allows your life to flow freely with life. Baal, Molech, studying of the stars, idol worship. Those things have significant influence, curses, destinies, confusion in many people's life. What am I exposing myself to? What have you exposed to others? And you may think, we all think, well, it's, it's innocent. Is it? Is it innocent? Anytime we begin to place our, place, um, our values upon something else than God's Word, upon Him as God, and Jesus as the only Savior, on the way to access to heaven, we begin to trust other things. What am I associating with? Opposing thoughts, actions, affections, the little things that we have to take a stand against. It all seems innocent, and children deserve the right to be innocent. This past week, we did something on Wednesday night. Those of you who are here, you know, it's called MAP. Um, minors, minor attracted persons. Minor attracted persons. What is a minor attracted person? It's little kids that adults are attracted to the little kids. There's not counselors for people that are attracted to kids. It's not a negative. It's not, not a pedophile, but they're minors, and they're being attracted Whatever it is. What's it again? Mind attracted persons, that's it. It doesn't come natural for those things to happen. Something has happened in people's lives as a whole, and we regress down to this. Sex slavery, sexual bondages, sex, sensual bondages, risk kids. Minor attracted persons. Power of the rich and people a position feel that we are expendable. The great problem of depravity within the mindset of fallen man, the desires of evil men, no boundaries, no restrictions, the fallen sin nature of man. The problem is within us and there is no good thing. And then we add influence of the dark side and the demonic relationships and many people have. And if you're not careful, you need to guard your heart against anything that is evil, anything that is dark, anything that is questionable. If you have tarot cards or whatever they're called, you have an Ouija board, I'm not telling you that every little thing, every, every rock and roll band is going to send you to hell. I'm going to say that every country music song is about sitting at a bar and drinking with somebody's and somebody's wife or something. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying all those things are bad. But I'm telling you, you have to be careful what you associate with. You have uncommon, uh, uncommon uh, relationship with someone and it would be your downfall, it would work to your, your demise. And the last thing I'm going to talk to you about is the spirit of lust. Now, some of you will get real uncomfortable, get real uncomfortable when I talk about this. Because, especially when I talk to the men for just a minute, if, if, you, if I can. The desire is to have something that pleases your flesh, your carnal nature and its desires. Proverbs chapter 6 Proverbs chapter 6, verse 24 and 25. Don't desire her because she is beautiful. Don't let her, let her capture you by the way she looks at you. A prostitute, a prostitute would treat you like a loaf of bread. And a woman who takes part in adultery, it may cost you your life. How many people? Last week I had a whole list of, of people in ministry pastors and stuff that got involved with someone sexually not even involved with them sexually just started a relationship with them and it has been their very demise what was the problem with pastors lust absolutely lust is always about the seeing lust and lust, lust is always in the natural it's never about the integrity of the person it's never about the value of the person it's always a, from a lustful carnal nature and it's something about a man they're so driven by this lust component that it takes them to a place they never ever should go and in today's world we have a lot of opportunities for lust to come into our life and we have to guard harder than ever even though it's always been 
but it's not always been readily available to us in which we live today. Years ago, one of my kids said, Man, the worst thing that has happened to America has a cell phone. Absolutely. It's the worst thing that has made everything in our life destroyed. And some of you can relate because some of you, the very thing that drives you to lust the most is your cell phone. People you're looking at, things you look up, things you watch. If you really think about it, when you're sitting there and nobody's around, you're on your phone, scrolling through things you should not be scrolling through, there is, a, there is a, an evil presence there as well. Don't think that God's presence is there. He's saying, well, run, run. Throw the phone against the wall. Break it, bust it, do something. Your value to God is much more greater than what that value that is to you. Flattery, lips that flow with the sounds, entice. They can compliment you and say a lot of things. You've heard me say this before. Flattery is like perfume. Flattery is like perfume. It's to be smelled, not swallowed. In other words, it's just temporal. It's just temporary. Somebody can flatter you, say all the right things. It's just temporal because eventually you're not going to get the flattery anymore. You're going to get the judgment of, of a, a person saying those things. Flattery is not the same. Go to Proverbs chapter 7. Verse 6, once while I looked at the window of my house, I looked out through the shutters, and I saw some foolish young women. I noticed one of them had no wisdom. Young men. Foolish young, some foolish young men, and I noticed one of them had no wisdom. He was walking down the street near, her, near the corner of the road leading to her house. It was twilight. It was twilight in the evening, and darkness of night was just beginning. The woman approached him, dressed like a prostitute, planning to trick him. She was loud and stubborn and never stayed at home. And I begin to think, there's a lot of people I've known over the years that have been that way. Before they came to Christ, they were loud, obnoxious in your face. Against everything that is morally right, they would just say any things, and they were crude with their vulgar language. Girls, I'm not talking about guys. The guys are too dumb. They're too, the suckers that, that heard her talking and saw her and saw the, the lip gloss and all the stuff. The woman approached him, dressed like a prostitute, and planning to trick him. She was loud and stubborn. She never stayed at home. She was always in the streets and in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the city squares, waiting around on the corners, and she grabbed him and kissed him. Without shame, she said to him, I made a fellowship offering. It took some of my meat, some of my... Meet my home. Today I have kept my promises. So I have come out to meet you. I have been looking for you and have found you. I have covered my bed with co colored sheets from Egypt. I have made my bed swell, uh, sweet, smell sweet like myrrh and aloes and cinnamon. Come, let's make love until the morning. Let's enjoy each other's love. My husband, my husband is not home. He has gone on a long trip. He took lots of money with him. He won't be home for weeks. By her clever words, she made him give in. And by pleasing her, his words, it led him to doing the wrong thing. All at once, he followed her like an ox led to the butcher, or as a deer caught in a trap, and shot, and shot the liver with an arrow like a bird caught in a trap. He didn't know what he would, he did not know what he would, would, would kill him. Now the sons, now my sons, listen to me. Pay attention to what I say. Don't let yourself be tricked by such a woman. Don't go where she leads you to go. She has ruined many a good man, and many have died because of her. Her house is on the road that leads to death and leads down to the grave. I'm going to explain a little bit, a little bit more about this and kind of some words I think we can relate to. Um, I would encourage you, I don't know what the sermon's called, but Robert Morris has a message. He speaks about this chapter alone. I guess pretty much all it is. And I, some of this, some of these words I say or whatever may come from, from Robert Morris because he was very insightful. The thing about Robert Morris, he's a great pastor of a big church in Georgia, not Georgia, uh, Texas. But he had a past in this. And as many things that he went through in life, this is the thing he began to struggle with. Verse 8 and 9, there was no direction. He was looking for something. A 
place that would present opportunities for him. Uh, but this place he was walking was a place of weakness. See, listen to me. He had been there before. He'd been probably on that street before, paying attention to different things. And, and she finally came up to him. But what she do? She let a big kiss on him. And a guy, if he's already looking for something, his mind's in the wrong place, all you need is a little attention. And he'll take you down and destroy everything about you in your life. He was not intimidated by the place. A person who indulges in repeated, repeated sinful ways will be a person who figures out ways to end up in that place where they can fulfill sensual desires. Verse 14, she explains that she has things covered with peace offerings, justifying her actions. And it's amazing how many times you and I may have justified everything in our life. Justifying, find ways of saying it's okay because of this, it's okay because of that. And we justify our actions, we justify our very lives. When you begin to have to start justifying something, you're asking for trouble. Verse 15 through 18, she entices him with all the work she has done to trap him. She made it sound so great and so wonderful. In verse 19 and 20, here's the first, this is the thing I remember Robert Moore saying. For the first time, for the first time in history, listen, everybody please on this, you're not going to get caught. You won't get caught. Now, go ahead. You can get involved in whatever. You're not going to get caught. You thought it too well planned. That woman and you have been talking at the bank or, or that guy you've been talking to at Walmart or whatever it is, a common, just a common transaction can result in a weird look or a strange look. It can result in a, in a touch of the hand for some reason or a touch something. But it begins to start something that should not be allowed in your life. You won't get caught with her. She has been very careful, very careful, and it is well thought out. Everyone thinks they won't get caught. But listen, everybody does. Everybody does. Everybody does. You may think that nobody knows, and you're careful, but your arrogance is our weakness. Verse 22 through 26 in the King James is that many strong men have fallen to her. Many strong men have fallen to her. It's something that's spiritual. It's not just one woman. It's something that's passed down from generation, every generation. When you're young, people entice you. Relationships you have entice you. The words we speak, the relationships we develop, and the power of lust are the three most common things to us in our world. Even though they're common, they will bind you and they will control you and they will send your, hell, your soul to hell. Because that's the, from the very beginning when I was, began to talk about the demons and anything about strongholds and things, the demons are, and Satan is not going to be killed like we are. They're eternal beings. Take you from one person, go out and roam and find some place else to, to abide. But in our life, I, but Jesus has come that you and I may have life. We can have it more abundantly. Don't be mad at me. Don't be awkward when you see me. Don't. Because it isn't about that. Not from my perspective. It's taking John 10, 10 for what it says. The enemy comes to steal your life, to kill your life, and destroy your life. But Jesus came to give you relief from what has always been and to give you a way of living that you've never known before. That is the greatest thing we could ever ask for. It's our journey here on earth that is blessed and is anointed and we're obedient to what God says for us to do. It troubles my heart and I'm sure it troubles yours. You see the condition that we currently live in in America. But is not just America? It's other places too. It's all across the world. Man has been so bent on fulfilling the things that is important to them. That they've become entrapped 
and involved in all kinds of things that are ungodly and not beneficial in the life of a believer. We all have heard sermons that life and death are in the power of the tongue, and it is. You may be here, you're constantly seeing things that are negative and unprofitable for everyone else that hears them. That is a hang up that's in your life. There's people in here having unnatural relationships with people. You develop the strongholds in people's lives, especially sensual, sexual relationships you've had with people. Soul ties. And the last group was just pure old lust. Not just men, there's women too. But something that controls you all the time. They're going to begin to sing in just a minute. I read a prayer last week. I don't know if you heard it or not because of the music and stuff, but there's something about repentance. If you don't have repentance in your heart, you're not truly repentful of this thing, this this bondage of this thing that's entangling your heart. But if you are, it's amazing what the steps that will begin to happen in your life. Repented, a repented heart changes everything. And after you repent, you have to look at yourself and say, okay, God, now I'm going to renounce. I no longer give any rights to the enemy to my life, this stronghold that's been involved in my life. The thing has plagued me and bound me for years. I no longer want it or desire it. Because, friend, a lot of times you may have prayed for forgiveness, but you never asked to be set free. Praying for forgiveness is something we fall on our face and we, we ask for forgiveness. But to pray that you want to be set free and begin to renounce all the things in the past. Addiction, compulsive behavior, bad decisions, a loose tongue, improper relationships, lust from your heart. Those are all things that have to come from a a different perspective than just repentance. You need to recognize that you no longer want that in my life. Because if you don't, it will control you the rest of your days. Father, in the name of your Son, not necessarily an easy thing to preach about and not something everybody was just hooping and hollering about, but God, I know this. There are people in this room. They've repented many times. But they never turn from their ways. God, I believe this morning that they're sick of living this way. They surrendered all to you and ask you to come into their life in a way you never had before. When we begin to sing this song, if, if it's you this morning, it doesn't matter if anybody else is looking at you or who it is or, or anything else. It doesn't matter who you are. I said this last week. We choose our dignity many times over deliverance. And I believe a lot of people have lived a very miserable life because they believe in, they're holding on to that dignity. They don't want anybody to know. But God's saying, come just as you are. Just as you are.